So hey guys, welcome to our channel Fiction Domain. And also welcome to the another amazing story on what if Naruto had bloodline of great snake lord. Here is short summary. Only knowing the feeling of being cold his whole life, Naruto struggles until he meets the accidental cause of his coldness, who just so happens to offer to teach him to control it and become strong. By learning from his new sensei, he learned to harness his bloodline and become something great. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now let's start the story. From his earliest memory, all Naruto could remember was being cold. No matter the temperature he always felt like there was ice in veins. He remembered one day when he was six where everyone in the village was sweating and complaining about how it was the hottest day of the year, yet he was still bundled up in a sweater and could see his breath in front of him. Growing up in the orphanage he would shiver day and night due to no one giving him any extra blankets, the matrons there saying he was looking for attention and should stop trying to cause trouble. They refused to touch him for some reason, so there was no way they'd know how cold he was anyway. Even when his breath would fog they'd just turn a blind eye. Then he had been kicked out of the orphanage on his fourth birthday because the orphanage was overcrowded and was forced to live out on the streets for two months. An unpleasant experience he wished to never relive. After he was one day found by a dog-masked Anbu and brought before the Hokage, he was given his own apartment, which was nice for a while. The apartment was only three small rooms, a small kitchen, a living room bedroom, and a bathroom that had a toilet, a sink, and a shower. But it was his. At the orphanage he had never had anything he could call his own, so having a whole apartment was amazing to him. He had a heater that he could sit near while huddled in blankets and warm himself up, as well as hot water which always felt really nice on his freezing cold skin. He also started drinking tea whenever he could for the soothing heat it would spread within him. And for a while things were pleasant in his new home. Then soon after he moved and the water stopped heating up. Then the heater didn't work either. And soon he found himself cold again. No matter the amount of blankets he curled himself up and he couldn't find that same heat he had been able to enjoy. He had asked a hokage about it when he came by for a visit one day, but after a couple weeks nothing had changed so he didn't bring it up again. The hokage was a busy guy after all, there was no reason to bother him with his problems. So for the next year and a half he remained cold. He had long since gotten used to the constant shivers and seeing his breath in front of him. No one else seemed to pay attention, or they just ignored it, but he did. Sometimes he would just sit by the window, watching people while he drew shapes when his breath would fog up the glass. He would draw random things while he watched the villagers go about their days, mainly he would draw the sun while thinking about the heat other people felt from it, and some days he would draw little figures he called his parents. He had never known anything about his parents. He assumed he was orphaned during the Kaiubi attack which happened when he was born, but no one had ever told him who they were. He still liked to imagine having parents like other children though. The hugs they would get always looked warm to him. The orphanage workers had said someone like him didn't have parents though. He never understood what they meant, everyone had parents right. Even the other orphans had parents at one point in time. The hokage was even more tight-lipped than the matrons were. He would just redirect or ignore the question altogether. So like his heating problem, he stopped asking when it became obvious no one wanted to tell him. Living on his own got lonely pretty quickly for him though. At the orphanage there were people all around, be they workers or other orphans, but in his apartment he was all alone. This rang especially true three months after he moved and when everyone else had moved out and he was the only person living in the building. No one told him why they moved out, but he figured it was his fault. He was always told at the orphanage that he caused problems for everyone, so he assumed the people didn't want to get caught up in these problems that he seemed to cause. When the loneliness would get bad he would venture out into the village to be around people. This usually backfired and caused him to feel even more isolated because everyone seemed to avoid him. Whether he would walk around the merchant district, the parks, or anywhere else in the village, everyone seemed to cut him a wide berth. The whispers he would hear were the worst part though, usually they would be along the lines of him being the fox boy or demon brat. He never understood what they meant when they whispered things like that. Whenever he would get back home from one of his walks, he would look in the mirror to see what was so different about him that the villagers could see that he didn't. He had shaggy red hair that was white at the end. He had clear blue eyes that looked like ice, which he thought always looked rather nice. He had a normal nose and normal mouth. His face was slender with just a bit of baby fat. There were no scars on any part of him, and there were certainly no fox ears or a tail that would garner him being a fox boy. There certainly wasn't anything that made him look demonic either. He usually wore a red hooded sweater and black sweepants in an effort to keep warm, even if they only worked a little. All in all, he was pretty average. So in the end he had no idea why people avoided him or called him strange names. It seemed that to everyone else he was a demon and that to him he was just a boy who had trouble remember being warm. 
Hearing his alarm clock go off, the now seven-year-old Naruto opened his eyes and literally looked around his room while he felt around for his alarm. Finally finding the switch on the side and turning it off, Naruto sat up and wiped the sleep from his eyes and yawned quietly. He didn't have any neighbors so he didn't have to be quiet, but Naruto liked being quiet. The quiet was comforting to him because if it was quiet there wasn't anything being said about him. Pulling the covers off his body, Naruto slowly got out of bed and silently walked to his bathroom to get ready for the day. He didn't actually have anywhere to be, so getting showered or dressed wasn't really needed, but the monotony of his routine kept him from just sitting in his apartment all day. A standard cold shower later, Naruto was dressed in his regular clothes and wandered into the kitchen. Pulling out his teapot, Naruto put in some water and set it above the stove to heat up. Tea in the morning was his favorite time of the day. He would be granted a few minutes every morning where the heat from his cup would seep into his fingers and spread through his chest after every sip. He would always have to drink it quickly to keep his natural coldness from chilling his drink, but it was worth it for the small moments of heat he could feel. But then the heat was gone, and his normal coldness would spread inside him again. Putting his cup in his sink to clean later, Naruto ate a small breakfast of cereal and grabbed his latest book off the table and started to read. The book was about the history of Konoha, from its as founding up until the Kaiubi attack, and Naruto found it quite fascinating. It detailed all about how Hashirama Senju and Madara Chiha founded the village and brought all the warring clans together and lived in relative peace until Madara led and attacked the village. There were chapters on how Konoha fought so well in the three shinobi world wars and how the village had never lost in any of the wars. The last chapter was all about the destruction the Kaiubi had brought upon the village and how the Yandame had fought the nine-tailed fox before he sacrificed himself to kill it. The main theme he noticed about the book was how Kanoha was so strong and able to persevere through so many terrible events throughout history. He had read this particular book a few times and had even borrowed quite a few other books about Kanoha from the village library in an attempt to learn about the village he lived in. The Hokage had talked to him before about the Will of Fire and how great a village Kanoha was. How it had the greatest shinobi, the richest history, and how it was able to handle any threat and become stronger afterwards. Naruto didn't understand any of it. He had never met any of the shinobi in the village, and they had never really done anything for him, so he didn't think they were as amazing as he was told. They certainly didn't do much to stop his apartment building from being vandalized, so to him, the Hokage must have been wrong. The Will of Fire was all about how everyone in Konoha was one big family, but he definitely didn't feel like he was part of a family, so that just confused him as well. The history of the village was cool, but Naruto thought the wars were kind of stupid and that Hashirama was even more stupid for giving something like the tailed beasts to the other villages. What kind of a peace offering is a huge living chakra weapon anyways? Naruto just found it all confusing. He didn't understand why the shinobi fought for the village. He didn't understand why the Hokage loved the village so much. And he certainly didn't understand why everyone treated him like an outsider. Hearing a knock on his door, Naruto put a bookmark in his latest book and headed for the door. His newest book was about another of the great hidden villages, Sunagakur. Naruto was fascinated by the idea of a village being out in the middle of a desert and how hot the village was supposed to be. He was intrigued by the idea of living in a place that was always hot and could maybe warm his chilled body up. The idea of being surrounded by a sea of heat sounded so nice snapping out of his musing, Naruto opened the door and sighed softly to himself. The Hokage was here. Again. Naruto wasn't sure why he was so special to warrant the Hokage coming to see him, but it was starting to grate on his nerves. No one ever wanted him around, not the matrons at the orphanage, not the people that came in to adopt kids, and certainly no one in the village. Everyone made it perfectly clear he wasn't wanted, but the Hokage always came to talk to him every couple weeks. Yet the man would never tell him why he was so special. Ah, Hokage-sama. Hello again. Feel free to come and I guess he muttered under his breath. The Hokage just gave him one of those kind smiles he always had. Hello again Naruto-kun, how are you doing today? Naruto watched as the Hokage walked in and sat on one of his two small couches. Sighing again, he closed the door and sat on the other couch across from the old man. I'm doing fine today. Just doing more reading. Naruto pointed over to the book about Suna. How are you today Hokage-sama? The man just chuckled, which annoyed Naruto all over again, as if he knew Naruto really didn't care, but it amused him that Naruto asked. Why come to his home just to play around? He only had this book for two more days, and he would like to properly read it before he had to return it. I'm doing okay myself Naruto-kun. The man said with another smile. So you're reading about Sunagakur today. Anything you've read that's particularly interesting. He sighed again, which was a constant in these visits. Naruto really didn't want to talk. He had gotten used to not talking over the years, couldn't the man just leave him alone? The heat I guess. 
The idea of a place being so warm sounds pleasant puppeteering is kind of interesting too. An odd way to fight, but it seems beneficial for the safety of the user if skilled enough. Naruto answered. Hopefully if he answered the questions he was asked the Hokage would leave and he could go back to reading. Yes it is an interesting way to fight. The Hokage responded with a hum. I've fought a few puppet users over the years and they're usually one of the trickiest shinobi to fight. They are quite crafty with their puppets and traps. Not to mention their love of all things poisonous. Naruto didn't have a response for the Hokage though. Although interesting, Naruto didn't really care. If he wanted to learn something he would look to the library. Kanoha didn't practice puppeteering, but he supposed there might be some information on famous users in a book somewhere he could learn from. So the room descended into a rather awkward silence for a few seconds, neither occupant knowing what to say. So Naruto-kun, the Hokage said to break the tension, have you any interest in being a shinobi yourself? I'm sure you would do quite well at the academy, it would also give you the chance to grow strong like the ninja you've read about. Plus you could meet other children your age and maybe make some friends there. Naruto felt like this was his millionth sigh of the day. He knew the man meant well, but Naruto was a little more than annoyed at him. He was always talking about making friends and talking to people. He had tried before and it never worked out, didn't he know that? I appreciate the belief in whatever talents you believe I have Hokage-sama, Naruto drawled out, but I don't think the academy is really a good fit for me. I've never had that much interest in being a shinobi myself. I'm not from a clan like all the famous shinobi in the history books, and there isn't really anyone to train me, so I'd probably just fall behind everyone else. Naruto admitted to the Hokage. Plus, I don't like my chances of finding friends anywhere, let alone at the academy he muttered under his breath. Are you sure Naruto-kun? I'm sure if you gave it a chance you would surely come to enjoy it. Naruto could hear the odd level of pleading in the man's voice, which confused him greatly. Why was the man pushing for him to join the academy, he was just an orphan with no last name and no clan, why did he care so much? Okajama. Naruto said with a pointed look to the man. Why do you care if I join the academy or not? I mean I appreciate the vote of confidence, I really do, but why me? I'm just Naruto, a clanless orphan, why does it matter if I'm a shinobi or not? He finished with a visible heavy breath escaping his lips. He could see the Hokage freeze up for a second when he finished his questions. It had been obvious to Naruto for a long time the Hokage knew something about him that he didn't want to say. It might have been about his parents, it might have been about why people didn't seem to like him all that much, but it was something that the man didn't want to say. The Hokage averted his eyes from Naruto's own and looked uncharacteristically weary, something that caused Naruto to raise an eyebrow at. He had never seen the man do that before. Usually he would shrug off his questions and change topics, this was the first time he had shown such a look of weakness. But as soon as it was there it was gone just as swiftly. I just believe you would do well as a shinobi. Just because you aren't from a clan doesn't mean you can't be strong. The Yandane didn't come from a clan and was an orphan much like yourself, but he still became one of the most powerful shinobi the world had ever seen. He snorted at that. The Yandane may have been an orphan, but Naruto was sure nobody kept secrets about his heritage or called him a demon. Whether you believe it or not doesn't matter much to me Hokage-sama. Naruto said with a roll of the eyes. I know I wouldn't do well at the academy. If not because I don't have a clan, then most definitely due to me being demon or whatever else people seem to think I am. I doubt any of the teachers at the academy would be very keen to teach my anything. He could see more hurt flash through the man's eyes, probably at the comment of him being a demon. Naruto didn't care if it caused the main a heart attack, if he didn't want to give him any answers, then he didn't feel all that bad about the old man's emotional turmoil. The villagers are just confused about something they don't understand Naruto-kun. I'm sure if you became a great shinobi they would come to respect you. I'm sure if you worked hard enough you could even become Hokage one day. Although Naruto was sure the man meant well, he was getting tired of his persistence. I have no desire to earn anyone's recognition or respect. In this entire village no one wants to extend a hand to me, why should I bother to do the same for any of them? Why is it my responsibility to prove my worth to anyone? He asked through gritted teeth, his fingers gripped onto the edge of the couch. Going unnoticed by either of the room's occupants was the thin layer of frost forming around his fingers. I'm sorry Naruto-kun, the Hokage said quietly, but I can't tell you why well then we're done here, aren't we? Naruto snorted. Please feel free to leave, and when you no longer feel like lying to me you're free to return any time you wish. Maybe you can bring some answers as a nice party favor next time. He finished sarcastically. If that's what you think is best Naruto-kun. Please think on being a shinobi a bit more, I really do believe you could be great. Like I said, your belief in my abilities is appreciated, but ultimately unneeded. I don't care much for being a shinobi, let alone one for Kanoha of all villages. Goodbye Hokage-sama. Pointing to the door, Naruto watched the elderly cage exit the apartment and close the door behind him. 
Releasing yet another sigh, Naruto took a deep breath and exhaled it slowly in an effort to calm himself. Who the hell did the man think he was? Just because he was Hokage didn't mean he could just lie to him repeatedly, then try to convince him to become Hokage of all things. He laughed at the idea of him as Hokage, the notion was absolutely ridiculous. Picking up his book to continue reading about Suna's cages, Naruto lost himself in the pages and let the earlier conversation fade away. It didn't matter what the Hokage believed, Naruto had no interest in being a ninja. As long as he was free to read his books and learn what he wanted to he was just fine. Garizin Saratobi took off his Hokage hat and sighed from behind his desk. He had always feared his decisions about the young Redeed would cause this to happen. It was his own fault really. Why would a boy who had been neglected his whole life have any interest in becoming a shinobi of the village that shunned him? The real problem was that neither Hiruzen nor Naruto had much of a choice in the matter. Naruto was a Jinchuriki, the container to the nine-tailed demon fox, the Kyubi no Yoko. Naruto had to be a shinobi. If it wasn't just the fact that he had a demon with a limitless supply of chakra sealed within him, the boy's heritage practically demanded him to be a shinobi as well. The boy's parents were some of the strongest shinobi Hiruzen had known, one of them being much stronger than himself, and the other could probably give him a good run for his money. With Minato Namikaze and Kishina Yuzumaki being the boy's parents, it was in his blood to be a ninja. His father was one of the strongest shinobi to emerge since Hashirama Senju, being touted as the fastest man alive, able to slaughter hundreds of enemies within seconds, and later going on to become the Yandame Hokage, Minato had truly been a fearsome man. Kishina was nothing to scoff at either. With her prowess in view in Jutsu, Kinjutsu and her ability to materialize her chakra into physical chains, she was quite a powerful Kinoichi in her own right. Yet Naruto knew none of that. His father had asked for Naruto to be treated as a hero, but with everyone feeling the loss of the Kaiubi's attack, they all felt the need to put the blame somewhere. And with Yu and Jutsu being such a complicated art that few understood, they just knew a small redeeded boy had the beast within him, and that was good enough for their hate. It had gotten so bad in the days after the attack that he had had to pass a law forbidding anyone to speak of Naruto's status as a Jinchuriki in order to give the boy a chance at a life of normalcy and safety. Fat good that did. People just switched from openly hating him to actively ignoring and degrading the boy, even going so far as to keep their children from him. Sometimes he cursed himself and other times it would be his wayward spymaster and the boy's godfather, Jiraiya. After the Kaiubi attack, Jiraiya had dived back into his job as spymaster, saying the village needed it now that they were so weak after the attack. But Hiruzen knew the real reason, the man was wallowing in his depression over losing his prized apprentice and wanted nothing to do with his godson. Sure he sent money for the boy, but it was obviously out of obligation rather than love. Hiruzen was sure Minato and Kishina were rolling in their graves because of Jiraiya and the village they sacrificed their lives for. There were days he wondered what was actually stopping him from telling the boy everything. In the beginning he had said it was for the boy's safety. The world would be terrified of the child of two S-rank shinobi like Minato and Kishina, and that wasn't even factoring all the assassins Iwa would send in hopes of killing Naruto just for being Minato's son. But the boy was barely safe from threats inside the village, if he knew his heritage he could at least have the option of learning from the large library of techniques his parents had known and have the chance to grow strong enough to protect himself. Yet Hiruzen didn't want him to be a spoiled child who bragged about being the son of the Yandame. Even if he didn't tell Naruto of his heritage, there really was nothing stopping him from telling the boy about the Kaiubi. Although Hiruzen had hoped the young Redeed would have a chance at a normal life, he really should have known better. No matter how much he had wished it, Naruto really had no chance at normalcy when he became a Jinchuriki. With the village's hatred of Naruto and their steadfast work in isolating him, he really didn't have the option of anything but a normal life. Yet still he persisted in not telling the boy anything, if only for his own foolish beliefs in his village and that one day things would get better. God that even sounded cowardly to him. He really cursed Jiraiya for leaving his godson in his care. This was the whole reason his student was named Naruto's godfather, so in the event Minato and Kishina passed away there was something to look after their child. It wasn't fair to him that he should have to look over a village in Naruto. He had already been Hokage and a father before and he didn't really have the energy to be either at his current age, let alone both. Releasing a sigh and thinking it best to drop the whole Naruto becoming a shinobi issue for now, he grabbed a pen and some ink and decided some paperwork would clear his mind for a little bit. He could only hope that Naruto came around and decided to become a shinobi on his own, otherwise Hiruzen figured he'll end up being forced to send Naruto to the academy against his will, and he did not want to deal with an angry Naruto anytime soon. It had been a few weeks since the Hokage's last visit and Naruto had been relieved the elderly man hadn't come back around. Without any interruptions he had been able to focus on reading new books from the library. Though this time he had been reading with a clear purpose in mind. 
there was a reason the Hokage was so set on Naruto becoming a shinobi, and if no one would tell him why he'd just have to find out himself. So Naruto checked out books on whatever he could find and took notes on anything and everything. Whatever he figured pertained to him he would pin on his wall and connect it to the question he had in the middle of his growing web, why am I different? So far he had been able to add quite a bit to his little conspiracy board, though he didn't actively call it that. There were a few notes surrounding his internal temperature, or rather how low it always seemed to be, and how cold he was all the time. There were a few questions about his lack of parents, but there wasn't much he could do about that. He had no last name to work off of, and he couldn't find anything about a clan with red hair. He had no access to the village registry or his medical records, so he couldn't even find any information about his heritage that way. In the end it was just dead end after dead end, so he let the question of his parents be, or at least until he had some info to go work with. He had also made notes surrounding his birth and the Biju that had attacked that day, as well as anything he could find on the other Biju themselves. He had found it strange when he read about Hashirama sending the Biju to the other nations that there was never anything written about the Biju causing damage or attacking the villages once he had left them there. He doubted that all the villages had some secret Mokuten user to calm their Biju like Hashirama did so he wondered how they were restrained or hidden. There also wasn't anything saying they were used as weapons in any of the three wars, yet the Kaiubi had shown just how effective the tailed beasts were in causing random destruction. Surely if the other nations had these chakra beasts that could cause such devastation they would use them in something like a war, wouldn't they? And for that matter, if the Biju were capable of being killed, why hadn't any of the others been killed like the Kaiubi had? Surely getting rid of the chakra beasts would be more of an effective peace offering than giving all the nations living super weapons, Wold so Naruto worked off those questions and added whatever he thought was the answer to his wall. He figured the Kanoha did whatever the other villages did to hide their Biju, but he just didn't know what that could be. He had look up a bit about sealing, but there was only mention of seals used for storing items or containing bodies for transportation. He didn't think anything that could hold a kunai or a dead body could hold beings like the biju, but then he read that fuinjutsu and sealing was a limitless art, it being completely dependent on the skill of the creator of the seal. That got him thinking, so he looked up everything he could find on the yande meant sealing. The result surprised him. Apparently Minato Namikas had been a master fuinjutsu user. He created tons of seals due to his prowess in them, the most well known being his space-time one, the Horation. It literally allowed him instantaneous teleportation. So if that was possible, why wasn't sealing a Biju also a possibility? The only problem was that he didn't know how this all involved him. Sure he was born the day the Kaiubi had attacked, but none of this was actually helping him. So he spent another 10 days researching and reading more books, all coming to more dead ends, until yesterday when he had found the answer. Or rather, it found him. Sitting on his couch and tossing another book beside his couch in frustration, Naruto forced out a slow breath in an effort to calm himself. Every book he finished had felt like was he taking one step forward, but two steps back. Nothing was giving him the answers he needed, yet he felt like the answer was looking him right in the face, and all he had to do was reach out and grab it. He just didn't know what he was supposed to be reaching for. Deciding he needed to clear his head and take a step back from all this, Naruto got up and made himself a small cup of tea. Tea always relaxed him and calmed down his freezing cold body. Allowing the tea to warm his insides for a brief moment, Naruto closed his and let the tea work its as magic. Tea really was amazing to him, not only did it have a soothing fragrance, it also warmed him and let him fully relax and wind down whenever he drank it. Truly a magical drink opening his eyes, Naruto blinked and realized he was no longer in his apartment. Instead he was in some odd sewer-like tunnel with a sheet of frozen water in the bottom, which was really odd because it was the middle of summer in Kanoha and there was no way the village's sewer system could be frozen over. Looking up to inspect above him, he noticed two pipes were running along the ceiling, one being nearly frozen over with a small amount of blue liquid running through it, and the other one seemed to be glowing with a red bubbly energy that felt extremely warm and oddly dangerous to him. Looking over his surroundings one more time and seeing there was nothing besides the pipes above him and the random torch spaced out along the wall for lighting, Naruto figured his best option was to start walking and find a way out from wherever he was. This was easier said than done though, as what felt like an hour of walking later turned up neither an exit nor any other paths. It seemed this tunnel only had one direction and he was being forced to follow it. Coming out into a large room, Naruto noticed this place just seemed like a larger version of the tunnel he was just in. There were the same torches on the wall, and the ground was still frozen over. There were a few differences however, the two minor ones being that the frozen pipe seemed to disappear into the middle of the ceiling, while the bubbly red one turned in the middle of the ceiling before it disappeared into the darkness behind the biggest difference this room had. It had a large cage in it. Actually, Naruto thought large didn't accurately describe this cage. It was absolutely massive. 
It had large steel-like bars that ran from the frozen ground all the way to the ceiling. The lock was also weird too, in that it wasn't a lock so much as it was a piece of paper. Taking a few steps to get a closer look, he noticed the word seal was written on it. This was all so strange to Naruto. What type of being could possibly need a cage this big to hold it? Musing over the possibility that whatever was in the cage must have been quite powerful to require this level of safety, Naruto was unprepared for felt like a wave of pure power and death to wash over him. He had always thought he ran cold, but his usual temperature had nothing on the pure dread this power caused him. It was terrifying and it felt like it was making his blood literally freeze over. He also noticed he hadn't taken a breath in 20 seconds and let out a large exhale and gulped down a few shaky breaths. It was when the room started to shake with the sound of footsteps that he snapped out of his shock for a second and looked into the cage, causing his eyes to widen. As the footsteps got closer, he was able to see more and more of the creature that caused his earlier terror. The first thing he saw was big red, slitted eyes. Then came a red fuzzy snout and big rabbit-like ears attached to a large fox head. Then the rest of its body came out of the shadows and into view, allowing Naruto to see the nine flowing tails and immediately recognize the being in front of him. Ayubi he whispered out. That's right brat. The Biju snorted out. Good job on not fainting when you saw me. Knowing how weak you humans are I figured you would have passed out right away. Kami knows enough of you did that when I attacked your village and people felt my power wash over them. Naruto could admit he had no idea what was happening right now. The Kaiubi was right in front of him. He had been pondering what had happened to the great beast during his investigating, but he didn't think the answer would just drop right in front of him while drinking tea. So he asked the only question that his frazzled mind could conjure. Huh? He could hear the fox chuckle at him, no doubt because he probably sounded so stupid right there. But it wasn't fair really, what was a seven-year-old supposed to say when presented with the strongest being in the world? Very intelligent question there kid. Want to try again? The Kaiubi said sarcastically. Sorry, uh, I mean what are you doing here? I mean, everyone says you're dead, I wondered if that was true myself, but you know he finished off lamely, mentally smacking himself for sounding so unintelligent right now. I guess if you must know, I was sealed away the day I attacked. The fox begrudgingly replied. Though I will say this, I'd like to see anyone else take on the Shinigami of all things and come out unscathed. How your Yande managed to pull off summoning the death god of all things I'll never know. Naruto wasn't sure, but it sounded like a mix of anger, respect and amusement when it talked of the Yandame. The Shinigami sealed you? How is that even possible? I just said I didn't know brat, Kami you humans are stupid sometimes. Naruto had the decency to flush an embarrassment at that. But yes, the Shinigami sealed me away in a host in return for the soul of the Yandame. Hopefully that bastard human is enjoying himself in the gut of the Shinigami for doing this to me. I'm sure the side of my chakra he took is keeping him good company too. Did you say host? He sealed you away in a living being, how's that even possible? Naruto really did want to know. This could open up new leads in his investigation. Yes kit, host, as in a body. Are you actually listening or are your ears just for show? Naruto was beginning to suspect that sarcasm was a favorite of the large kitsune. Due to my immense chakra, only a living being could house me properly. I'm too strong for an object and an animal, as I would just overload them both with chakra until I was free. So instead your yandame sealed me away into a newborn, thus allowing its as undeveloped chakra coils to adjust to my presence and safely house my chakra without exploding. All rather clever I suppose it finished, muttering the clever part lowly. Naruto supposed that all made sense. The Kaiubi was the strongest of the Bijuu, and judging by the small taste of its immense power he felt earlier, the full thing must be totally overwhelming. Although the newborn part was curious of this newborn he apparently sealed you in, is it the obvious answer, or am I allowed some level of mercy from Kami, and the answer isn't what I think it is. The fox just chuckled, giving him the answer anyway. Maybe you aren't as dumb as you look brat. Yeah, sarcasm was definitely a favorite. Yes, I am sealed inside of you. We are currently inside what could be called a sealscape, basically meaning we are inside the seal. A meeting room of sorts. Naruto was thankful the Kaiubi was kind enough to explain things. This was all rather overwhelming. Well I guess that answers why people don't like me all that much Naruto muttered under his breath. Would you be able to tell me exactly why I was chosen for the ceiling? Was I just convenient or should I brace myself for more shocking truths? When the kitsune smirked, Naruto decided to brace himself for whatever was about to be said. Well I've never been a parent myself, but I imagine most parents would rather use their own child before asking someone else to give up their own, now wouldn't they? Well fuck. That was why no one would tell him who his parents were. Because his father was the fucking Yandame. Naruto had never sworn before, but this seemed like the proper occasion for swearing. So the Yandame was my father. Receiving a nod and another smirk, he continued on. 
Is there any chance you know of my mother? Was she famous as well? While not as famous as your father, your mother was definitely strong in her own right. She had to be to house me didn't she? His eyes widened at that, the Kaiubi had been sealed in someone before yes kid, I've been sealed before. Twice actually the Kaiubi grumbled out. First in the wife of your Shadai Hokage, Mito Yuzumaki. Then when she died I was moved to your mother, Kishina Yuzumaki. After I was removed from your mother I was sealed once again into you, my third container, Naruto Yuzumaki Namikas. Naruto was having trouble breathing now, though he did hear something about damned Yuzumakas. Um, wait, you said removed right. Receiving another nod, he asked the other question on his mind. Is that why you attacked, because you were removed from my mother? Naruto was surprised when the Kaiubi snarled and released another wave of pressure from behind the cage. The fox had been rather civil, if a little sarcastic, during their conversation. This was the first time he had seen it angry. I never wanted to attack your foolish village when I was released. Why should I waste my time on what you stupid humans do? If you want to blame someone, blame those cursed Ichiha and their stupid eyes. The kitsune roared out. The second I was free from your mother I was put under a powerful Jinjutsu and sent to attack your idiotic village by some masked Ichiha. Next thing I know I'm free from that damned eye and staring right down at the Shinigami. Your father sells his soul to seal me away into you, and your mother dies soon after due to her being weakened because of giving birth to you and having me ripped out of her. Naruto just nodded along. He finally had answers. This was amazing and depressing all at the same time. He finally knew what that lying hokage had been keeping from him all this time, as well as why he was so adamant about getting him but in the shinobi program at the academy, because Naruto was basically a living weapon. Um, thanks for telling all this Kaiubi. Naruto said with a small smile. I never really figured I'd find out about my parents and everything else, so this means a lot to me. So uh, thanks, again you whatever kid, don't get all teary eyed on me now. The fox said with another rumbling chuckle. Now beat it so I can go back to my nap. We'll talk some other time. Before Naruto could say anything else, another hot blast of power pushed him backwards and launched him from the seal. Blinking from the shock of suddenly finding himself back in his apartment, Naruto looked down and noticed his tea was still partially warm. Figuring that time in the seal must have moved a lot faster, Naruto took a soothing sip of his tea and leaned back into his couch. With all the information given to him, he had a lot to figure out now. After doing a bit more work on his wall with the new info he had, Naruto went to bed that night content with everything that he had been told. Though it opened up more questions like who the masked Ichiha was and why he wanted to use the Kaiubi to attack Konoha, it answered his immediate questions. Ino knew the name of his parents, that he was the container for the Kaiubi, and that the Sandane was a damned liar. Looking to his wall, he thought it best to get rid of everything he had put up on it so as not to arouse suspicion. He figured that if people didn't want him to know any of this, he wouldn't give them any reason to think he did. But thinking, quite the clever kid aren't you? Ah. What the hell was that? Naruto could hear a sigh come from within him. Never mind kid, I take back what I said. You're still just as stupid as everyone else. Wait a sec, Kaiubi. Is that you? This was really weird, he didn't think the Kaiubi would be able to talk to him when he wasn't inside the seal. Do you have any other large foxes inside of you kid? It's obviously me and no need to say anything out loud. I believe you were just talking about concealing the information you know, so there's no need to make people suspicious by looking crazy and talking aloud to no one. Although he could hear the condescension and sarcasm in the fox's voice, it didn't change that fact that the fox was right. No need to make people start looking at him more than they already did by looking like he was talking to himself. Sorry Kaiubi, was there something you wanted? There we go, much better. And as a matter of fact there is something you can do for me. Naruto wasn't sure how, but it almost seemed like he could picture the fox adjusting itself while they were having their mental conversation. We need to talk about your training. Training? What training? Come on kid, use your head a little. You may only be seven, but I know you're smarter than this is. Trying to ignore the snort that came from within his head, Naruto waited for the kitsune to continue. Obviously your shinobi training. You were complaining to the wrinkled human before about how you didn't have a clan or the proper teacher if you were to become a shinobi. Well no you have both. Plus hopefully once you get some chakra control training going, you can stop shivering all the damn time. Seriously, if it wasn't for the fact I can heat my side of the seal I would have frozen over by now. Wait, you're going to train me? And what do you mean chakra control, what does that have to do with me being cold? Naruto was eager to know this. He had been cold as long as he could remember, if there was a way to train so he could stay warm, then he would do whatever the large fox wanted. I keep forgetting you're only seven so you don't know anything about chakra. He could hear the Bijuu sigh from within his mind again. This seal he had was seriously amazing. 
chakra is what fuels a human and also allows shinobi to breathe fire and that other junkyu humans do with it. Every human also has an affinity to a certain element, them being earth, water, fire, wind and lightning. Now you're special because due to inheriting your father's and your mother's strong wind and water affinities, you also have my chakra leaking into you, which actually caused your two affinities to combine within you. My affinities combined. How is that possible, and what does this mean? Naruto enjoyed learning, so if the fox was offering to teach him more in the future, he already found himself leaning towards accepting. This shinobi business was really fascinating stuff. What it means is that due to my dense chakra being mixed into your system through the seal, you have a kekai genkai, or a bloodline. Your body is naturally mixing your two affinities to create ice chakra, thus chilling your body. So that was why he was always cold, his body was literally creating ice. And because you have so much chakra for a human your age and no control over it, it runs rampant inside your body, causing your chakra to chill you so much. Oh wow. I had no idea that was possible. So if I want to control this and start, you know, not being cold all the time, what would I have to do? That's the easy part kid, I'll be training you. That way you can control your damned ice chakra and hopefully I won't have to be constantly putting out chakra to keep myself from freezing over. Rubbing the back of his neck and chuckling a weak sorry, Naruto let Kaiubi continue talking. Unfortunately you'll have to attend your dumb shinobi academy to keep up appearances, so once you talk to your wrinkled leader, we'll start your training. For now we can work on the fundamentals, so the first thing you need to know about chakra is that it's made up of. Sitting in the back of his classroom that he had been stuck in over the last four years or so, Naruto let loose a sigh and ignored Aruka sensei's rambling about the genin exam that was tomorrow while he stared out the window. Training over the years had actually been fun, something he had never experienced. Although a sarcastic ass sometimes, Kurama had been a really awesome teacher. Much better than anyone at this Kami Forsaken Academy, that's for sure. At least his sensei, despite being a mountain-sized fox, actually taught practical skills as well as history. Knowing how to fight was more likely to save your life than knowing that Hashirama Senju was called the god of shinobi and had the Mokuten Kekai Genkai. His relationship with his tenant sensei was a rather odd one. Over the years he had finally learned that Bijuu had a name, which was Kurama. He had to train relentlessly for two years before he had earned enough of the fox's respect and had been graced with his amazing name. Damned fox and his high and mighty attitude. Though despite everything Naruto still liked to call Kurama a friend, sarcasm and all. His tenant was an awesome instructor, hid method to explain the fundamentals, most so he could find the answer on his own, by working with what he was given, was what made learning so great. This boosted his already quick mind into becoming a better problem solver and quick thinker, as well as giving him the odd quirk of needing to know how every jutsu he used worked. Takra control took months to get to an acceptable level, even with the shadow clones he was eventually taught how to use. Due to the Bijuu being sealed inside his mother and Mido, Kurama knew a lot about shinobi training, as well as some stuff the fox developed on its own. All this resulted in Naruto now having near-perfect control of his chakra, despite having cage-level reserves at the age of 12. He had the chakra control to learn medical ninjutsu if he wanted, but neither he nor Kurama knew of any and Naruto didn't have access to actual jutsu yet, so they were at an impasse there. The jutsu and physical conditioning was sped up immensely due to the healing factor Kurama's chakra gave him on top of his Uzumaki vitality. Due to this awesome healing combination, Naruto was able to train intensely every day and be back in fighting condition the next day. It also resulted in him being able to train every muscle every day because his muscles would always heal no matter how torn they got. Kurama had taught him how to fight by teaching him a tojutsu style designed around foxes. It used a lot of clawed swipes and swift movements to slowly wear your opponent down by causing minor wounds all over their body until you were able to go in for the kill. His tojutsu style mixed well with his tojutsu training, as it was because of his bloodline training, he was able to effectively use the kitsune no tsum, or fox claw tojutsu style. Due to intense training in water and wind manipulation, as well as ice, Naruto had near-perfect mastery over all his elements. This allowed him to form a set of ice claws over his fingertips, giving him the ability to actually claw at his opponents. Another benefit due to his elemental training was that he was able to use high-class ninjutsu with fewer hand seals due to the knowledge Kurama had from Mido. Apparently his tenant's first host had seen the nidame Taburama Senju training quite often and had learned a lot of his work on water manipulation. Due to the intense work and water manipulation he put in, Naruto was able to effectively pull water out of the air and even use the suetan. Water Dragon Jutsu with only 5 hand seals, instead of than the standard 40. He was working his way down to only one, but it required tons of practice with the technique. The same also went for his mother seeing his father's wind manipulation training, so Naruto was able to train the two components of his bloodline rather well. 
The Uinjutsu was, as odd it was to him, usually used as a relaxer for him. It all came to him so easily that it was frightening to both him and his Kitsune Sensei. Due to Kurama having been sealed in two Fuinjutsu mistresses, he had a lot of knowledge to pass on, and Naruto soaked all of it up nearly instantly. Once he had the basics down he was able to absorb anything Kurama taught him and was able to recreate it within a week. Their study into barrier seals was a blessing, as it allowed them to do intense ninjutsu training, without alerting anyone of the large amounts of chakra being expelled all the time. This Fuinjutsu work also gave him the opportunity to renovate some of the empty rooms in his apartment building. By selling some of his basic seals, storage and explosive, under a false identity and henge to shops, he was able to make enough money to buy all the rooms on his floor and turn them into a large sealing workshop. This allowing him to test any seals he wanted from inside his own home, thankfully the barriers would block any explosions caused by his experiments. Unfortunately his Hyoten Kekai Genkai training was pretty much imagination mixed with trial and error, because other than a clan in Kurigakurno, had the Hyoten bloodline, so there was no ninjutsu to learn. He had been able to create a number of ninjutsu and was now able to control it well enough that he didn't need to be huddled in warm clothes anymore though. Now he wore clothes that were inspired from all his unknowing senseis. He wore standard black shinobi sandals and black shinobi pants, as well red bandages on his right thigh that had seals woven into the fabric to hold his kunai and shuriken, the bandages representing Mido and her knowledge that taught him seals. He wore a tight, long-sleeved dark blue shirt that had white fur lining the neck, an homage to Tabarama and his teaching of water manipulation to him. Over that he wore a standard jonin looking flak jacket, except his was a dark red with black trim around the sides and didn't have the high neck others had. It also had the Uzumaki clan symbol on the left shoulder with a three-pronged kunai stitched in the middle of it, both representing his parents. Luckily no one thought anything of the symbol. And although he wanted to put a big nine-tailed fox on his back, he and his sensei both agreed it was a rather bad idea at the moment. No need to send everyone into a panic over the fox taking over or whatever nonsense the people believed. The academy and its curriculum was basically a waste of time, and Naruto either sent clones in his place or treated it as a way to rest from his own intense training. And although the naps he had and other bad behaviors cost him the Rookie of the Year title, Naruto didn't really care. He was second in the boys and third ranked overall which was fine, being only behind Sasuke Chiha for the boys and Sakura Haruno for second overall. Naruto actually hated the both of them, though for totally different reasons. Neither of them for jealously he would assure you vehemently. Sasuke Chiha was an arrogant douchebag. It was as simple as that. Ever since the Achiha massacre when they were eight, Sasuke had become a great A acid. He had a permanent scowl on his face, and Kurama liked to joke that his hair looked like a duck's ass. He would always go on about how he was in Achiha, and during spars he would say that only an Achiha can beat an Achiha, so it was unnecessary for his opponents to fight him. That usually caused Kurama to roar with laughter, because it was literally Sasuke's older brother Itachi Achiha who massacred the Achiha clan. It was also funny because Naruto would always beat Sasuke in spars. It was because Naruto always won in his spars that he hated fangirls, especially the screeching fangirl voice of Sakura Haruno. Although a somewhat pretty girl, her personality was absolutely terrible. She believed Sasuke was Kami's gift to the world and would violently attack anyone who said or did anything that proved otherwise. And because Naruto always beat Sasuke in the academy spars, Sakura would always end up screeching at Naruto about how he cheated or that Sasuke was just having a bad day. Any excuse that would let the delusional girl continue believing that Sasuke was still infallible in her eyes. The other fangirls were bad, but Sakura was very much the worst. It was only due to her being book smart and having her weak to jutsu forms memorized that she was the top kinoichi in the class. The rest of the class was okay for the most part. Shikamaru Nara, a boy who probably had a diagnosable case of laziness, was usually good for a match of shogi once in a while. Shikamaru's friend, Choji Akamichi, was pretty laid back as well and usually provided conversation during their shogi matches, though was very gentle and would usually avoid sparring people as he was afraid to hurt them. Tiba Inuzuka was a braggart, also extremely loud, so Naruto tended to avoid him at all costs. Though his Ninkan partner Akamaru was pretty cool. Ino Yamanaka was a Sasuke fangirl, so he hated her as well, though she was a somewhat serious Kanoichi, so he didn't hate her as much. Hinata Hayuga was different though. She was the only Kanoichi in training that wasn't obsessed with Sasuke and trained hard. Unfortunately she was also terribly shy and had severe confident issues, usually resulting in her doing a turtle impression whenever called upon and ducking her head into her oversized jacket. Everyone else in the class were civilian children, so all of them were pretty mediocre. Naruto didn't really pay much attention to them, if he paid attention to them at all. 
Looking back from his view of the sparring grounds outside, Naruto listened as Aruka sensei finished explaining what their genin exam would be on and proceeded to wish everyone luck for tomorrow. Naruto snorted at that. After four years at the academy, he didn't need luck to pass the academy's pathetic exam. All he was focused on was the fact that in 24 hours he would finally have a hit I-8 and would be able to learn from a Jonin sensei. He only hoped he either got a Jinjutsu or Ninjutsu specialist. Ninjutsu would be cool because he had the reserves and control to toss around Ninjutsu all day for fun if he wanted, but he and Kurama both had an interest in Jinjutsu. Neither of them knew much in Jutsu besides one that was used by Tabarama called the Bringer of Darkness Jutsu, and although it was an extremely strong illusion, it didn't have the same finesse and subtlety of other Jinjutsu. Though learning to fight without sight was a great training method. Walking out of the academy and to his apartment, Naruto let his usual impassive look remain on his face while he traversed through the streets with his eyes closed. He had long since learned to ignore the looks and whispers from those around him, and his walks let him work on his sensory skills and make notes on new ninjutsu or seals. Trying to decide on what he wanted for dinner tonight, Naruto headed up the steps to make dinner while preparing for the next day. Soon he would finally be Jen and Naruto Uzumaki Namikas. Soaking up the heat from the early morning sun, Naruto smiled as he practiced his daily chakra control exercises. As part of his usual training routine, he had to practice chakra control daily due to his ever-growing reserves. He had looked into locking the part of the seal that allowed Kurama's chakra to trickle into his own reserves but decided against it in the end. As confident as he was in his few injutsu abilities, he didn't know much about his own seal and didn't want to risk himself exploding or something by messing with it. Plus relaxing on a small waterfall and balancing leaves all over his body using chakra was a pleasant trade-off for larger reserves. He did this every morning before he would head home for some breakfast and head to the academy. His day usually started with a 5 a.m. wake-up, followed by chakra control practice. Then breakfast and the academy, which usually meant naps for him. Following the academy would be physical conditioning and practicing his tojutsu forms, then some light ninjutsu practice and dinner. After dinner would usually be few ninjutsu or some reading to relax. Every part of his day was planned, which allowed him the best mix of relaxing and training, resulting in him getting stronger day by day. Ninjutsu had hit a bit of a standstill in the last few months, mainly because he didn't have any ninjutsu to practice. Nido and his mother didn't use much ninjutsu, as they preferred using seals or in the case of his mother, kinjutsu and her chakra chains. Although both Uzumaki women had seen their fair share of ninjutsu from Hashirama, Tabarama, and his father, neither of them had really bothered to learn the mechanics of many of the techniques they witnessed. Usually it was up to Kurama to break down the ninjutsu he had stored away and break it down so Naruto could learn it, and then Naruto having to say something along the lines of how amazing his sensei was so that Kurama would actually teach him. He had an extensive list of water ninjutsu from both Tabarama and Hashirama, but didn't have a lot of wind ninjutsu. He actually didn't have any. His father wasn't one for elemental ninjutsu, so besides training his affinity, he didn't bother to learn any besides some basic techniques. Other than the Horatian and different variants of the Rasengan, his father didn't use a whole lot else. Sadly, his mother had never had the space-time ninjutsu explained to her, so neither he nor Kurama had been able to do much in learning his father's prize technique. Though the Rasengan was easily learned once Kurama realized it was based off his own chakra-based attack, the Bijuadama. The A-rank technique was pretty awesome and allowed Naruto to practice his shape manipulation to a high degree, but he didn't really like using the technique. His preferred method of combat was water or ice ninjutsu with a mix of tojutsu. The Rasengan was cool, but he didn't like the fact it was a one-off attack used in close range. He'd much rather stick to close mid-range combat and fight up close with his Hyoten. Ice claw jutsu while mixing in a few single hand seal water jutsu from a distance to keep his opponent wary. He was looking forward to when he could finally start getting real-world experience, as no matter how many times he fraught his clones, it didn't provide the real thing. Only by fighting lots of opponents and different style would he finally be able to see if his combat style was effective. Sitting up from the waterfall and shaking loose a few stray drops of water from his hair, Naruto hopped down to the ground and looked over his training ground. He had found training ground 34 when he started training and claimed it for his own. Luckily most people preferred the lower number training grounds because they didn't like having to travel this far out, but it worked perfectly for Naruto. It had a clearing that was good for sparring, a rocky outcrop that trained him to be aware of his footing at all times, and it was surrounded by tree, so he was able to practice fighting while tree hopping. It also had a small waterfall that was perfect for his wind and water manipulation training, resulting in it being the perfect training ground. Leaving his training ground and hopping up into the trees, Naruto was a little excited for the day's events. 
today was the Genin exam, meaning he could finally start working on his actual shinobi career, rather than be stuck in a classroom all day. No offense to Aruka-sensei, but daily lectures were annoying and unnecessary. He would finally be able to take missions to earn money and hopefully gain access to a medical and jinjutsu teacher. Despite his money from selling his seals, he was only able to do that from time to time, as his false persona was of a traveling merchant who sold basic seals to Konoha's ninja shops once every two months. Though the lessons in budgeting his money was a good experience, he'd like to see his classmates try to plan out their finances to last every two months and still be able to pay rent for the five apartments that made up his home workshop. Walking through the village and going up the steps to his apartment, Naruto hopped into his shower and relaxed under the warm water. Temperature seals were a true miracle to him, and he was so glad he had developed them in an effort to provide himself with hot water again. By using two storage seals that were interconnected by a heat seal, he was able to store the cold water and funnel it through the heat seal, causing it to heat up to a nice temperature and be expelled through the releasing storage seal in his shower head. They were also great for heating up water for a cup of tea quickly. Finishing up his shower and getting dressed in his usual shinobi clothes, Naruto grabbed a quick breakfast of eggs and toast with some orange juice and headed out for the academy. Only a few short tests and he would finally have his hit I-8. He wondered what colored cloth he should get and where to put it looking over the written test in front of him, Naruto had to wonder just what the academy hoped this would do to help the shinobi to be in his class. How did the fact that Tabarama created the Ichiha police help a shinobi stay alive? Every question was absolutely ridiculous and had no place in shinobi studies. If he was ever Hokage, this awful curriculum would be the first thing to go. No one way would his village teach this crap beyond the second year of the academy. Learning history was all well and good, he loved reading about the history of the nations, but these trivial facts and tidbits they were being tested on was unnecessary. He understood that knowing where you come from was important, but knowing historical facts about your own village didn't help you survive. Finishing up the test and handing it over to Aruka-sensei and receiving a good job in return from the friendly Chunin, Naruto walked back to his desk and laid his head on its side and watched out the window. There were still a few more tests for today, and he wished he could just speed through them without having to wait. Now that his written test was done, the following test would be the shuriken and kunai throwing test. The test was meant to see the student's proficiency in their throwing skills by having them use 10 shuriken and 10 kunai to hit static targets. How that proved they were skilled in throwing was beyond him. How exactly was your ability to hit a stationary target while standing still proved to anyone you were an accurate shinobi? He highly doubted an enemy shinobi would just stand still and allow you to line up your throws. After the kunai shuriken accuracy test was the sparring and tojutsu portion of the exam. Each student was to be put up against one of the instructors and would either have to win the spar, land five hits, or survive the three-minute time limit to pass. He hoped he got Mizuki-sensei for his sparring partner. It would be nice to inflict some damage to the white-haired Chunin who had it out for him. Although the practice in dispelling the Jinjutsu Mizuki would always place over his tests were helpful, it didn't change the fact it was annoying and pissed off the redeated boy something fierce. After sparring would be a short break for lunch, then the final test would be given, the Ninjutsu exam. This was the worst part of the exam to Naruto. He understood that it was up to their Jonin sensei they received outside the academy to do the bulk of their practical training, but the academy really dropped the ball on ninjutsu training to him. How in the hell did they expect any of them, especially the civilians, to be able to survive out in the world with only three rank non-elemental ninjutsu? Even if the Kawarimi and Henge were both valuable tools, the standard illusion clone jutsu was an absolutely useless technique. Being able to substitute or hide yourself with a transformation were invaluable in being able to survive, but what purpose did a non-solid clone that didn't even have a shadow provide? He was just happy he had his water clone and shadow clone jutsu to use. He couldn't imagine using anything besides solid clones. Hearing Aruka-sensei announce that they were headed outside to start on the accuracy test, Naruto supposed he would just have to remain patient and hold in his utter exasperation over today's test. He wanted a hit I-8 dammit fastening his new hit I-8 with a black cloth around his neck, Naruto smiled to himself from within his apartment. It wasn't often he smiled outside of when he achieved something in training, and despite how much of a joke the genin exam was he was still happy he had passed. The beating he gave Mizuki was a good boost to his already good mood too. Though he supposed he had his sensei to thank for training him so well. You're welcome kid. I know it's hard for you to accept my greatness, but it's nice to hear you're starting to learn. Although I didn't mean for you to hear it, thanks anyway Kurama. Sighing at his tenant's huge ego, Naruto decided he would do some study in Fuinjutsu before he went to bed for the night. He was currently working on a barrier seal that was powered by the chakra of the person that was trapped inside of it. 
hopefully he would be able to use it as a means of prisoner containment or as a method of wearing down opponents into chakra exhaustion. Either way, he was sure he could sell it to the torture and interrogation department as a way to hold their prisoners one day. Here is in Saratobi looked over the Jonin who were in his office that were applying to be senseis this year. Compared to most years, this graduating class had a large amount of clan children, specifically clan heirs. But there being the heirs to the Hayuga, Akamichi, Nara, Yamanaka, Inuzuka, Aburam, and Ichiha all in one class, it was no surprise that he had 20 jonin looking to become a sensei this year. No doubt most of them were looking to be able to notch being a sensei off their bucket list by teaching a three-man cell of clan children. Although there were a few that didn't fit that idea. Kuranayuhi was one. A rather new jonin who specialized in Jinjutsu, this was her first year applying for a team. Kuranai was a beautiful woman with long dark hair and crimson eyes and was known as the Ice Queen of Kanoha due to her cold attitude to all the men that would hit on her. She was a very serious Kanoichi but was known to be a rather kind woman to people she liked and was likely the top Jinjutsu practitioner in the village. Here is in knew she would make a good Jonin sensei to the new Jenin that were placed under her. Another one was his son Asuma Suratobi. Although not having the best relationship with his son, Hiruzen could admit Asuma was a very skilled jonin. He was clever on the battlefield and was talented in his use of trench knives, mixed with his wind manipulation. He had the experience from serving as a guardian for the daimyo and would definitely do well as a sensei. He would have to be sure to place him with a team that would benefit from having a sensei that valued planning and teamwork. The other noticeable jonin in the room was Kakashi Haddock. Despite being an extremely lazy man with an even bigger affinity for erotic novels, Kakashi was probably the strongest jonin in the village. Jenin at 6, Chuanin at 8 and Jonin at 13, his rank was well earned. Coupled with the Sharingan under his hit I-8, he was a very skilled individual. He prized teamwork above all else, but had never taken a Jenin team in all his years as a Jonin. Well, he had never passed one. Hiruzen figured he was looking to teach the last Ichiha and his sensei's son who both graduated this year. Clearing his throat and drawing all eyes to him, he looked over his list of graduates before he addressed the room. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. We have a new batch of graduating students this year, and this meeting is for the purpose of designing the best possible three-man cells we can. He said while looking over the sea of Jonin before him. Now before we start, does anyone have any requests for a team? If so, please step forward and explain your reasoning. Seeing the three Jonin he was just thinking about step forward, here is an allowed a small smile to form on his face. He should have known some of his top shinobi would already have something in mind for their teams. Nodding to his son, he allowed Asuma to go first. I would like to request to have the new generation of Ino Shikacho for my team," said Asuma, briefly pausing to take a small inhale of his customary cigarette. The Ino Shikacho is a legendary team formation in our village's history, and I see no reason to split them up now. I'll be able to teach them proper teamwork, and assuming the Nara boy is as smart as his dad, I'll be able to teach him tactics and planning too. They'll most likely work well as an information gathering and interrogation team like their parents. Yes that sounds like a fine plan to me. Hiruzen said to his son, before turning his gaze to the Kanoichi before him. And what about you Kurenai? I would like to be able to put together a tracking and capture squad Hokage-sama. I believe that by putting Hinata Hayuga, Kiba Inuzuka and Shino Aburam on a team together, they'll be one of the best team of trackers in the village once they're older. Kurenai stated. But the ocular powers of the Byakugan, the nose of the Inuzuka, and the chakra draining powers of the Aburam, they'll be able to find just about anyone and be able to effectively capture any target placed before them. Hiruzen could see the merit in a team built around the three young new gen and Kurenai mentioned. They all had impressive talents on their own, but the idea of their skills altogether on one team was almost terrifying in its potential. Allowing Kurenai to step back, Hiruzen motioned for Kakashi to step forward while simultaneously ignoring his perverted giggling. I'd like to request Sasuke Chiha and Naruto to be on my team. The third member doesn't really matter to me. Kakashi drawled out while keeping his eyes on his book, Icha Icha Nurses. Hiruzen guessed it right. Unfortunately for Kakashi, he couldn't grant the elite Jonin's request today. I'm sorry Kakashi, but I cannot grant your request. Hiruzen apologized, not in the least surprised when the silver-haired Jonin snapped his book closed and leveled him with a piercing glare. Oh, why not Hokage-sama? Kakashi growled out, surprising those in the room for his open anger directed at the village leader. I am sorry Kakashi, but the village tradition has always been the rookie of the year with the top Kinoichi in dead last. By allowing you to have Sasuke and Naruto together would ruin the setup, as well as the team being unbalanced in talent, what with both the boys being incredibly strong for their age. Hiruzen could see the Jonin grit his teeth underneath his mask. 
He did feel bad for denying the request, as it was obvious to the Hokage that Kakashi was looking forward to being able to teach his sensei's son, most likely feeling a duty to teach the Yandame's only child. It was a surprise to everyone in the room that when Kakashi was about to argue back a cat mask Anbu member appeared before the elderly cage. Niko-san, what can I help you with? My apologies for interrupting your meeting Hokage-sama, but I believe I may be able to assist with your current predicament. Niko said to her leader. If Kakashi-senpai is okay with only having the Ichiha boy instead of both, I am more than happy to take young Naruto-kun as an apprentice. Oh, is that so Niko-san? And why would you be offering such a thing, may I ask? If you were to take an apprentice you would have to leave the Anbu, just so you are aware. Hiruzen was truly curious why his personal Anbu guard was offering to take on an apprentice. Apprenticeships weren't unheard of, but he was nonetheless intrigued by Nico's request. I guess you could call it a sense of duty if you were to classify my request as anything Hokage-sama. Ah, so that was it was it? Hiruzen should have figured as much. Nico, or by her true name Yugao Yuzuki, was once a student to the late Kishina Yuzumaki. It really didn't surprise him that she knew that Naruto was her late sensei's son. The request made sense now, if only that Yugao would no doubt feel a responsibility to teach Kishina's son like Kakashi did for his own sensei. And with Yugao being a skilled kinjutsu practitioner as well as having some basic skill in medical ninjutsu, Hiruzen could see what Yugao would be able to teach Naruto. With chakra control being a large part of medical ninjutsu, Yugao would no doubt be able to help the boy with his more than likely large chakra reserves. Between the Kaiubi and his Yuzumaki lineage, Hiruzen wouldn't be surprised if Naruto had more chakra than he did. What do you think of this Kakashi, are you okay with Niko-san taking Naruto-kun as an apprentice? Although Hiruzen knew Kakashi wasn't particularly happy with the arrangement, there wasn't much him for to say in the situation besides yes. Kakashi was the only one with able to teach Sasuke once he awakened his Sharingan, and Niko was more than talented enough to teach young Naruto. Receiving a nod from Kakashi and saying a quick thank you to Niko before she disappeared back into the shadows of the room, Hiruzen gave his list of students a quick onsi-over before he started listing teams. He had an idea who would be placed with Sasuke under Kakashi, it would just be up to Kakashi to turn them into an effective team. Clearing his throat again, Hiruzen started to list the teams. Team 1 under Jonin Sensei. After his usual routine of chakra control training, shower and breakfast, Naruto headed out for the academy. Today he would finally have a sensei to teach him, well a human sensei that wasn't trapped inside of him, but he digressed. He would hopefully get someone who could teach him something new and would be highly skilled. As long as they knew things he didn't know and was able to teach him, he would be happy. Walking in through the academy doors and traversing through the hallways, he arrived at his classroom and walked up to his spot in the back by the window as usual. Locking onto the chakra signatures of a few high-level shinobi outside the academy in the trees, Naruto wondered if the Jonin sensei were already here and were looking to observe the team announcements. Briefly trying to feel out which signatures were the strongest, Naruto was snapped out of his pondering and groaned when he heard the heavy footfalls and arguing of two Kanoichi getting closer to the classroom. His guess of who was making so much noise was proven correct when the door was blasted open and a pink-haired girl and a blonde girl ran into the room with their heads pressed against each other, their eyes locked onto the other with a glare that could kill a weaker human bring. I'm sitting next to Sasu Kun Ino Pig. I'm sitting next to Sasu Kun Forehead Girl. Naruto wondered if this was what all Kanoichi were like, focusing more on dieting and boys than training and growing on stronger. He certainly hoped not, his idea of his clan matriarch would be a strong woman who could fight alongside him and give him a run for his money during a spar. He had no desire to be with anyone remotely resembling a fangirl. By the twitching eyebrow on the usual brooding face of Sasuke, Naruto figured he held Naruto's own views on Kinoichi. Or he was gay, Naruto didn't really care about the duck ass to chair. All right everyone, quiet down and take your seats. Hiruka sensei said as he walked into the room. Naruto raised an eyebrow when he didn't feel Mizuki's chakra signature and noted that Aruka had some bandages on his face and arms. Today you are now genin of Konoha and I expect you all to act like it. Aruka declared with a pointed stare to everyone in the room. Now I will be listing the teams and going forward the two people mentioned alongside you will be your new teammates. They will be with you during all training sessions and missions along with your jonin sensei, so do your best to get along with one another and do your village proud. Hiruka sensei explained with a small proud smile on his lips. Listening to the teams being listed so far, Naruto wondered what the hopes were for the first six teams. Every single member of the teams were civilian children who barely passed the exam, so Naruto had to wonder if they were placed on teams together in the hopes that they would all either quit or go back to the academy. The village couldn't honestly believe that a few children barely stronger than the average civilian would do well as a shinobi, could they? Team 7 will be Sasuke Chiha, Sakura Haruno, and Sai. 
Your Jonin sensei will be Kakashi Haddock. He supposed that team made sense. Putting the rookie of the year with the top Kanoichi was a regular team placement. However, Naruto didn't have any idea who this I was. There wasn't anyone in his class with that name, so maybe he was an already graduated student who needed the two slots on his team filled. Whatever, Naruto didn't really care, congrats to the pink-haired harpy for getting placed with her one true love he guessed. The mate will be Hayuga Hinata, Shino Aburam, and Kiba Inuzuka. Your Jonin sensei will be Kurina Yuhi. That team made sense too. From what he knew of all the clans, which was quite a bit from his extensive reading into all the clans of Kanoha, Naruto knew why they were placed together. All of those clans were well known for their tracking ability, so no doubt they were put on a team together to play off each other's strengths. A rather effective team if Naruto were to admit. Team 9 is still in circulation from last year, so Team 10 will be Choji Akamichi, Shikamaru Nara, and Ino Yamanaka. Your Jonin sensei will be Asuma Suratobi. Ah, the Ino Shikacho formation. That team was practically a given. All the history books of famous Kanoha teams went on about the legendary teamwork of the Ino Shikacho, so it was no surprise they were all put together. Ignoring Ino's outburst about how unfair it was she wasn't put with Sasuke, Naruto realized he was the only one not put on a team. It seemed by the multiple pairs of eyes on his person, he wasn't the only one to notice this either. Team 11 will be Naruto Uzumaki, apprenticed under Jonin Yuga Yuzuki. Iruka finished as he rolled up a scroll with the teams on it. Good luck to all of you on your future careers as Shinobi of Konoha. I hope you all go on to do great things, and it's been a pleasure being your teacher. Your new senseis will be here shortly to pick you all up. Watching as Aruka left the room, Naruto looked out the window in an attempt to ignore the stares he was getting, as well as the murderous gaze of Sasuke. No doubt the Achiha was pissy about not getting his own private sensei, because he was an Achiha or some other bullshit reason. Though if his sensei wasn't here soon, Naruto would argue he wasn't responsible for the inevitable water prison jutsu that drowned the last Achiha. He was used to the glares he got from civilians, but it didn't mean he was okay with it. Hearing the door slide open, Naruto watched as random Jonin came into the room and picked up their teams. He watched as a gorgeous woman with a pair of fascinating red eyes came in and retrieved teammate. No doubt the dog boy Kiba was drooling over his new beautiful sensei. Though he would admit she was a very curvy and gorgeous woman. Next to come in was a tall dark-haired man with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth who picked up Team 10. Naruto supposed this was the Hokage's son, meaning he was probably a skilled Jonin if his father was any standard to go by. The second to last sensei to come in, with Team 7 still not having arrived, was a woman with straight purple hair that fell down to the middle of her back, warm brown eyes and red lips. She wore a black bodysuit with a grey flak jacket over her chest and a small patch of white bandages with a kunai holster on her right thigh. The sword on her lower back intrigued Naruto the most though, as sword users were rather rare in Konoha. Besides Kumagakur and Kurigakur, none of the other nations really practiced kenjutsu. My name is Yuga Yuzuki, would Naruto please meet me in training ground 18 within 10 minutes? The now named Yuga said before she disappeared in a swirl of leaves, indicating the use of the leaf style variant of the Shunshin. Getting up and heading for the door, Naruto gave a small smirk to the Achiha, which proved effective in making the Achiha go from glaring to trying to murder him with his eyes. Naruto chuckled while he left the academy, it really was too easy to piss off Sasuke. Arriving in training ground 18, Naruto looked around for his sensei. He knew he wasn't late as it had only taken him six minutes in a fast-paced jog to make it the training ground. Wondering what Yuga sensei was up to, he focused on his sensory skills and tried to locate his new sensei. Then pointing the decent-sized chakra signature, Naruto turned to the tree line just in time to see his sensei dash out of the trees with sword drawn. Leaning back so he was parallel to the ground while holding himself on one hand, Naruto ducked in time to see the flat of his sensei's sword flash past where his neck just was. Jumping back, Naruto pulled out two kunai from the storage seal on his bandaged eye and got into a ready stance with his left hand holding its kunai in reverse. Getting his guard up just in time to block a slash from his right, he parried it and pushed it away from him. Seeing the following strike was a crescent-shaped slash coming from his left, he quickly pulled up his other kunai and blocked that strike as well. Trying to stab his attacker with his free hand, Naruto was able to create some space when Yuga sensei jumped back. Good job in blocking my strikes Naruto-kun, but let's see how you do with Tejutsu shall we? Yuga sensei said as she sheathed her sword and dashed in with hands raised, ready to strike at him. Quickly resealing his kunai, Naruto raised his hands and flexed his fingers, letting his knuckles pop, allowing his hands to form their usual claw-like appearance without the added ice. He already knew he'd be revealing some of his talents to his sensei, no need to give away everything. Leaning back and to the right to dodge a quick jab and spinning away to dodge the follow-up kick, Naruto soon found himself being pressed rather handily by his new sensei. 
It really was completely different sparring against someone besides his clones, but he found he enjoyed the experience all the same. Dodging a kick aimed for his neck, Naruto ducked and pushed inside his sensei's guard, moving to counterattack. Swiping his fingers at sensei's chest, Naruto pressed forward when she dodged and followed up with three successive swipes towards her arms and face. Dashing all around his sensei and flowing between quick slashes and kicks, Naruto did his best to put his sensei on the back leg. It quickly became apparent though that his sensei was as skilled as a jonin should be when she parried every attack he threw at her, while launching some of her own quite easily. Disengaging from the close-up spar, Naruto took a deep breath to calm himself before he got back into his fox claw stance. Good work on Tejutsu, a very interesting style you have there. Very animalistic, I would say is the appropriate word. Yuga sensei said with a thoughtful smile before she formed a few quick hand seals. Now let's see your ninjutsu. Kaden. Grand fireball jutsu. Seeing the very large fireball quickly fly from his sensei's lips, Naruto did two quick hand seals and raised his fingers to his mouth as he responded with his own jutsu. Suiten. Water wall jutsu. Forming a wall of water in front of him that evaporated the fireball and created a layer of steam between him and his sensei, Naruto sensed for his sensei just in time to feel chakra being molded from his immediate left. Pain. Phoenix Flower Jutsu. Using another water wall jutsu to block the five smaller fireballs launched at him by his sensei, Naruto flew through some more hand seals to launch an offensive attack. Suiten. Wild Water Wave Jutsu. Launching a raging stream of water from his mouth, Naruto watched as his sensei back flipped and dashed to the left, effectively dodging his C-rank water jutsu. Very well done, I'm impressed with your current skill level. Very skilled indeed. I'm assuming you have a water affinity Naruto-kun. Naruto nodded, there wasn't much point lying at this point, he had shown quite a veritable amount of ninjutsu for some out of the academy. Besides, he was having fun sparring with his sensei. It's obvious you have a good handle on it. Makes me wonder what other talents you have hidden away, hm? Naruto chuckled at the teasing tone and smirk he was receiving from his sensei. He didn't really think to hide his skills beyond the higher-ranked water ninjutsu and his Hyoten bloodline. His teacher couldn't be expected to accurately teach him if she didn't know some of his skills after all. Though seeing her skill in kinjutsu from earlier prompted him to make a mental note in learning that too. His mother was a skilled sword user, might as well learn that as well. Judging by the chakra control you showed in the ninjutsu portion of the test, I can safely assume you can dispel jinjutsu. Giving his sensei another nod, she continued on. That's good to hear, means we can skip the third lesson on jinjutsu. So that means congratulations are in order, well done on passing the genin exam Naruto-kun. Naruto wasn't sure if he heard that right. Genin exam? He had just passed that yesterday, didn't he? Hearing his sensei chuckle, he supposed he looked rather confused right about now. Better to just get answers than continue trying to figure this out on his own. I though the genin exam was yesterday. You were named my sensei because I had passed right. That's partially true in a sense. You see Naruto-kun, the test you did yesterday was more of a way to weed out the students who had no chance of becoming genin. Yuga explained. By using the academy as a way to filter out the hopeless cases, the jonin sensei are able to test the graduates who are more likely to have a chance at becoming genin. We call this the true genin exam. All your other classmates are doing something similar with their senseis right about now. Those who pass become genin, those who fail either drop out or are sent back to the academy for another year. Naruto supposed that all made sense. He had noted that a lot of his class didn't have what it takes to be shinobi, so by using this dual-layered test, the village was able to effectively only take the shinobi hopefuls with potential into their ranks. This also had the added benefit of keeping the other jonin free to do missions, instead of having to teach genin that barely had enough chakra to keep up a hinge for more than two minutes. So what happens now, seeing as that I passed your test and all? Well how about we do some quick introductions to get to know each other properly, now that we've sparred a little. Yuga sensei said as she took a seat and motioned for him to do the same. So my name is Yuga Yuzuki. I like ninjutsu, cats, and sparring with Hei kun I dislike dogs and those who look down on Kinoichi. My dream is to one day be the top kinjutsu user in the village. Your turn Naruto-kun. Well my name is Naruto, no known last name. Although it was a lie, he didn't need people asking any questions. Plus he'd been playing the ignorant game for years and had gotten rather used to being known as just Naruto, even if he was in Uzumaki Namikas. I like learning new things and reading, as well as tea and hot springs. I dislike arrogant and stupid people. My ambition is to learn everything available to me. Also, I look to hopefully learning medical ninjutsu and jinjutsu now that I'm an actual shinobi. Those are good dreams and goals Naruto-kun. I know some basic medical ninjutsu myself, so maybe once we get your control to a good level, we can work on learning some medical jutsu. 
you'll have to learn all about the anatomy and poisons as well though. Two of my friends are actually skilled in poisons and jinjutsu, so I can see if they can offer any tips. That would be very helpful Yuga sensei It truly was. He really did luck out on the sensei lottery. Well now that we've introduced ourselves, you're free to do whatever you want for the day. I have to report in with the other jonin on which Jenin passed, so you have the rest of the day off. Meet me back here tomorrow at 8am and we'll start with training. Yuga sensei explained as she got up from her seat on the grass and wiped the dirt off her pants. Maybe we'll see about doing a mission depending on how the day goes. Seeing his sensei disappear in a swirl of leaves, Naruto got up and stretched. It was odd to think he had the day off, though he supposed he could go have a soak at the hot springs. Now that he wasn't freezing all the time he loved the hot springs. It was like immersing yourself in a hot blanket. Hey kid, what did your new sensei say her name was? Although not meaning to, he couldn't hold stop from jumping in shock. He knew the fox liked to spook him like that, but he couldn't help it. Despite how long they've been in communication, he never got used to it when his tenant would just randomly open their link and talk to him. Hey to you too Kurama. And she said her name was Yuga Yuzuki. Why do you ask? Naruto really was curious. Other than the occasional comment about killing Sasuke because of those cursed eyes, Kurama didn't show any interest in humans, other than himself of course, but Naruto figured it was mainly because he didn't want his container being weak. I thought the name was familiar. Your new sensei was once the student of your mother kid, probably why she wanted to apprentice you. From your mother's memories, it was pretty obvious this Yugao idolized her. Means she'll want to teach you properly. That's good to hear. If my mother taught her that hopefully means she really is skilled with a sword. Most likely it also means she won't be prejudiced towards me. Whatever brat. Lem go back to my nap and go do whatever you do when you're not being taught by my magnificent self. Sighing at the obvious dismissal from his other sensei, Naruto headed towards the village for a trip to the hot spring, he could hear the hot water calling to him. Theme 6 was a fail to Hokage-sama. Here is inside to himself. Maybe the academy was better off not accepting civilian children into the shinobi program. All six teams made of civilians failed this year, which either showed that the academy wasn't training them properly, or that the jonin were testing them too harshly. Seeing as it was peacetime, he was leaning toward the former. It was a common occurrence during times of peace for things to be a little more lax, but having six teams fail in a row was a little unsettling. Thank you very much Genma. Hiruzen said to the Takibestu Jonin. How about Team 7 Kakashi, how'd they do? They passed Hokage-sama, but they were an absolute track during the bell test. Hiruzen noted how exasperated Kakashi sounded, obviously his team wasn't living up to the expectations either of them had. Sai is a well-rounded shinobi with a unique style of ninjutsu, but he has no people skills and does a good job of aggravating his two teammates with his nicknames as he calls them. Sakura is a fangirl, physically weak and a disgrace to Kanoichi everywhere. She would much rather follow Sasuke can be protected by her knight in shining armor than train and become strong. Sasuke is the worst of the bunch honestly. He is the most arrogant genin I have ever met, he very much believes him being an Achiha puts him above all others. Even when I had swiftly defeated him after he attacked me head on, he was more enraged than humbled and blindly attacked me again. Pirazin groaned. That team sounded absolutely terrible. Separate their problems were manageable, but together they sounded more like a natural disaster. Waving for Kakashi to continue, Hiruzen hoped it got a little better. They failed the first part of my test, this resulted in me tying Sakura to a stump due to her having been knocked out during the test from a D-rank Jinjutsu. Sasuke refused to work with anyone, and Sai just seemed more amused than anything and smiled the whole time. Hiruzen noticed Kurinai's frown at Kakashi's story, no doubt angered by a girl who obviously didn't take her responsibility as a Kanoichi seriously. Afterwards I gave Sasuke and Sai a lunchbox and ordered them not to feed Sakura, then while I was gone, both the boys offered to feed Sakura, as they didn't want to have to fight with her on an empty stomach. I passed them for showing a small amount of teamwork in the end, but they need a lot of work to be anything decent down the road. I'm sure you can do wonders for your new team Kakashi, good luck though. Hiruzen chuckled out. This must have been a karmic punishment for Kakashi's tardiness and perversion. How about you Kurinai, how'd teammate do? Teammate passed as well Hokage-sama. Kurinai said with a proud smile on her face. I tested them in their ability to find me while I remained hidden in the woods, with the condition of finding me within a two-hour time limit or they would risk failing. Kiba immediately went to search for me on his own, but Shino was effective in keeping him from running off. Due to Shino's leading of the team, they were all able to find me after 75 minutes of searching and passed my test. Hinata was able to pinpoint the area where my Jinjutsu was with her by Akigen, and they all worked well with both the boys in finding my exact location and subduing me. They need some work on their teamwork, but they look to be an effective unit once they get used to working with one another. That was good. 
after hearing of the first seven teams he was beginning to worry about this generation of shinobi. The fact that Kurenai was smiling throughout her whole explanation spelled good things for her team. Motioning Asuma to speak, he hoped the good news continued. Team 10 passed to Hokage-sama. Despite them growing up together their teamwork needs a lot of improvement if they're to be as effective a team as their parents. Asuma said with a small frown. Shikamaru is the laziest boy I have ever met, but is a literal genius IQ-wise. Once pushed he was able to lead his team into scoring three hits on me, which was my test. Toji is a gentle soul, but needs to learn when to use his strength, because right now he's too afraid to attack anyone he considers an ally, even in a spar. Ino has a terrible attitude, a mixture of fangirl and brattiness. She believes herself to be smarter than her teammates, and on more than one occasion, stated she could lead better than Shikamaru, but didn't contribute much in the way of doing any actual work besides bragging. They have potential, but it's buried deep in there. Asuma finished with another slow drag of his cigarette, obviously depressed at the state of his new team. Like Kakashi, I'm sure you can show them the right way. I have faith you'll get them on track and turn them into the team I know they can be. Hiruzen said to his son, though inside he was wishing Kakashi and Asuma the best of luck. Fangirls were a truly terrible breed of Kanoichi. Now Yugao, how did young Naruto-kun do today? Listening as Yugao explained her testing of her new apprentice and the skills she had seen, Hiruzen found himself raising an eyebrow at Naruto's abilities. Although happy to hear that they boy had done so well, some of the points were rather worrying. Where did he learn his tojutsu style? How did he learn chakra control to the level he showed, as well as the water ninjutsu he showed too? Was someone in the village teaching him without him knowing about it? He'd go ask the young Redeed, but their relationship had always been rocky, ever since Naruto figured out Hiruzen was keeping secrets from him. He'd just have to keep an eye on him and hope there was nothing bad happening to Minato's son, probably a good idea to check his academy records too. I'm glad to hear Naruto-kun did so well during your test. He's a rather surprising individual, isn't he? Hiruzen said with a chuckle. All right everyone, you're free to go for the day. For those who failed your teams, better luck next time around. For those who passed, teach them well and I hope to hear great things about your teams. Have a good day. Seeing the Jonin all disappear, whether by Shunshin or by walking out of the room, Hiruzen relaxed back in his chair and looked at the large stack of paperwork on his desk that was calling out to him. Naruto would freely admit to whoever asked that being a genin was both a good and bad thing. The best part of finally being a shinobi was that he no longer had to attend the academy. No more boring lectures and no being forced to learn inane things. He now had the opportunity to learn what he wanted. Sadly there wasn't a lot of available material for new genin. Apparently everything over C rank was reserved for shinobi that were chewing in and up, so no studying high rank ninjutsu, and because of the fact wind ninjutsu users were so rare, there were no wind jutsu at all in the shinobi library. Luckily he still had access to books on ninjutsu and jinjutsu theory, so hopefully he could develop his own jutsu to make up for a lack of available material. Plus with the help of Yugao sensei and her two Kanoichi friends, he was able to learn the basics of a few things in the last month of being a genin. His sensei had been a humongous help in learning new things, and although she would always say he knew so much for someone his age and would drop hints asking how he knew so much, he still valued when everything he learned from her. They hadn't yet started studying kenjutsu, but she was still willing to help him in tojutsu and in the basics of being a mednin. Learning anatomy and basic healing was pretty interesting, and they'd be starting work with the mystical palm jutsu pretty soon. Also, thanks to the help of the scariest woman he had ever met, Anko Midarashi, he was also learning how to treat minor poisons. Anko was a fun person to learn from in that she knew a lot about the human body, mainly about how to torture and poison it, but she still knew her stuff. It didn't stop her from being an absolutely frightening Kinoichi. When she had found out he had a heightened healing factor, she got the largest, toothiest grin he had ever seen and proceeded to barrage him with kunai in what she liked to call Anko Tag. Her version of the popular children's game was basically the same thing, but for every kunai you got hit by you had to buy her a stick of dango. The benefit of Anko Tag was that his dodging skills and passive awareness were trained to a high degree. Probably why his sensei allowed her fellow purple-haired friend to play Anko Tag with him. By learning to always have his sensory skills activated, he was able to keep Anko from ambushing him, but that usually just caused her to blitz him with double the kunai. Luckily he was able to dodge about 80% of them, the other 20% only causing minor wounds, so unless he faced someone who had more kunai and sharp objects than Anko, he had a pretty good chance of coming out of that fight unscathed. Kurenai Yuhi was an interesting woman and Yugao sensei's other friend. She was the resident Jinjutsu mistress of Konoha and was more than happy to answer any questions he had on her chakra control exercises and also taught him a little on Jinjutsu. 
she had only shown him her flower petal escape technique, which made her look like she dissolved into flower petals and surround her enemy, which he had secretly modified to suit his own style. But it was a good stepping stone for learning how to use Jinjutsu to escape Jinjutsu. His version of the Jutsu involved him scattering into snow and using small flurry to surround his opponent. His snow flurry escape also had the added benefit of tricking his opponent's senses into thinking they were getting colder when the snow and his illusion touched them, making them believe the illusion more since it involved multiple senses. The rank missions were probably the worst part of being a shinobi though. Yuga sensei had been upfront with him and basically said they were a rite of passage for new genin, but he figured they were more like hazing. She had told him how there was no real reason for shinobi to do babysitting and grocery carrying missions, but he had to do them anyway. She had also said that once he got 40 D ranks done, they would look into doing a basic C rank mission. It was that promise that kept him from blowing up when people would scowl at him when he showed up for D ranks, like somehow it was his fault a Jinchuriki got assigned to carrying their groceries. The idea of seeing the world outside the village was a good deterrent from slaughtering some old lady who didn't want him painting her fence. Yuga sensei usually had a few choice words for some of the more vocal people who didn't want him doing their missions though. Yugao sat down beside her two friends in the dango bar and smiled to them. Now that she was no longer in the anbu she had more time to spend with her friends, so they had all started getting dango together, at Anko's insistence, so they could chat about their students or anything else. Usually Anko would complain at her increased spending on kunai because Nira-chan kept dodging all my throws. So how are you both doing today? Hey, Yugao-chan. Anko said in her usual exuberance. Me and Nai-chan are doing great, how about you? I'm doing fine. She replied as she grabbed a stick of dango and ate it. I'm thinking it's about time for me and Naruto to get a C-rank mission. Yugao saw the surprise on Kurinai's face. Though not unheard of, it wasn't very common for new genin to take C-ranks. Usually they would start once they had at least four months of experience. Are you sure Yugao? Kurinai asked hesitantly. We all know how talented and strong Naruto is, but do you think it wise to start C-rank so early? Don't worry too much Kurinai, Naruto will be fine. I still think he's holding back, so I'm hoping a mission will get him to show more of his skills. Yugao knew her apprentice was strong, definitely stronger than he let on, but she just wanted to know how strong he really was. Plus I heard Kakashi Senpai took his team on one last week, though that was because that Ichiha Brad on his team demanded one in front of the Hokage. Naruto is definitely more prepared than Team 7 was. That kid either has huge balls or rocks for brains, Anko whistled loudly, but either way he's still stupid. A few weeks in and he's already demanding things. Hopefully his attitude doesn't get him killed or maybe it will, who cares? Enko? Oh come on Nai-chan. The kid has got issues, everyone knows, but no one wants to say anything. Anko said while she simultaneously ate three dango all at once. Once he pops out some Ichiha babies he'll realize it's just the Ichiha name the villagers love about him, not his talents or whatever people say when they kiss his ass. Yugao knew Anko was right. Sasuke Chiha had a terrible arrogance problem that wasn't about to go away anytime soon, at least it wouldn't until the villagers stopped treating him like Kami incarnate. Diving back into the conversation, which was now about Kurinai's genin team, Yugao thanked her old sensei for giving birth to such an asigoing apprentice. Naruto truly was the perfect student. So Naruto-kun, you've completed 40 D-rank missions. You know what that means right? He could hear the teasing tone to his sensei's voice, as she had took great amusement in seeing him trudge through the chores assigned him to every day, but right now he couldn't care less. Relaxing and training ground 18 across from his sensei, Naruto had a satisfied smile on his face. He had just completed his 40th mission, a rather annoying mission he had done a few times already. Catching Tora was always a Yuga favorite. Apparently it was a favorite among the other Jonin sensei too, as a way to haze air, train their new genin, but Naruto and Yugao treated it as a test of his tracking and capture skills. Because the daimyo's wife's cat had been escaping genin team for years, Tora had developed pretty good hiding and evasion skills. It was a good way to put his tracking training to use, and he also currently had the fastest record of catching Tora. It had been a long day and rather than using tracking skills, he just used his sensor abilities and found and returned the cat within 10 minutes. He still found it amusing when the Chuanin working the mission desk saw the cat so soon and dropped his jaw in disbelief. Yes, Yugao sensei Now that we have 40 missions done we can take a C-rank mission right? Naruto hoped she didn't go back on her word, this promised C-rank was the only thing keeping him sane. Correct, Naruto-kun. Yugao sensei said with a chuckle. He figured he looked pretty eager right now, but damn did he want a C-rank. Well come on and we'll go see Hokage-sama about getting us an escort or delivery mission. Nodding to his sensei, they both stood up and disappeared in twin versions of the Leaf Variant Shunshin. 
Reappearing in front of the Hokage Tower, Naruto followed after his sensei while they walked through the large building. The Hokage Tower, besides being the office of the Hokage, had a few other operations inside it as well. It also housed the mission room, where Shinobi could pick up missions any time of the day. The village archives and Shinobi registry were in the tower as well. It was basically the information center of the village, but only those ranked Takibestu Jonin and up could access most of what was stored in it. Arriving in the mission hall to receive his mission, he was surprised to see the Hokage and Aruka sensei sitting behind the long table at the end of the room. Though not unusual for the Hokage to be running the desk, it was surprising to see him reading a letter that seemed to have been delivered by what looked like a pug wearing a Kanoha hit I-8. That was all sorts of odd. Yugao Yuzuki and Naruto reporting for a C-rank mission, Hokage-sama. Yugao said, drawing the attention of the Hokage. Ah yes, Yugao and Naruto-kun. Perfect timing. The Hokage said, motioning them to come closer to the table and handing the letter in his hand to his sensei. I've just received word from Kakashi and his team in the Land of Waves requesting back upon their mission. Apparently their C-rank escort mission turned into an A-rank mission when Zabuza Mamachi showed up to kill their client. Kakashi is currently out of commission due to chakra exhaustion, but thankfully Zabuza is recuperating from his own wounds as well. They suspect Zabuza to be working with someone pretending to be a Kiri Hunter Nin as well. The Hokage explained to both Naruto and his sensei. What would you ask of us Hokage-sama? His sensei said in what Naruto liked to call her professional voice. I'd like you and your apprentice to head to the Land of Waves and provide backup for Kakashi and his team. You're to be in charge until Kakashi is fully recovered and able to lead again. You have one hour to prepare then you're to be on your way. Packin, feel free to let Kakashi know Team Eleven is on their way to provide backup. Making a note of everything the Hokage had said and seeing the pug poof away into smoke, Naruto looked to his sensei for more instructions. Prepare for a two-week mission and meet me at the southern gates in 40 minutes. We'll do a bag check there before we head out. Nodding to his sensei, Naruto disappeared in a shunshun towards his home. Despite not getting the C-rank mission he wanted, an A-rank support mission with missing Nin involved was more than a satisfactory substitute. The trip to the Land of Waves had been done mostly in silence, the quiet only being broken when his sensei would explain Team 7's mission and what their role would be when they got to the home of their client, the bridge builder Tizuna. It seemed Team 7's mission had been a simple escort and protection for Tizuna, who had actually lied about the danger surrounding him due to a man named Gato. Apparently Tizuna was building a bridge in an effort to save his country from poverty by connecting them to the mainland to reopen their ability trade. This Gato character, who had effectively taken over the country, didn't like that, so he employed the services of the Demon Brothers and Zabuza Mamachi. According to the letter from this Kakashi person his sensei knew, Team 7 had defeated the two Chuanin missing Nin called the Demon Brothers and had proceeded on with the mission, even after they were told of the dangers and lies about the actual mission. Naruto thought that was stupid. If clients could just lie and still get their missions performed, what's to stop everyone from requesting C-rank so they could save money? Following the confrontation with the Demon Brothers, Team 7 continued on and eventually ran into Zabuza and gotten into a fight with him as well. The fight ended when the fake Hunter Nin had put Zabuza into a death-like state and disappeared with the body. Kakashi had gotten chakra exhaustion from the fight and was meant to be out for a few days to recover. His sensei had told him their role during the stay in Wave Country was to protect the client along with Team 7 and provide backup where needed. She made sure to let him know this wasn't their mission, they were just backup. Hopping from tree to tree, Naruto pondered that for a bit. As long as the Achiha and Haruno didn't get all in his face about him being backup, he would be okay. Looking down at the sleeping face of one Kakashi haddock, Naruto wondered if this man was really a jonin. The fact he was spooning an Icha Icha book caused a sweat drop to roll down the side of his head. His sensei had assured him the man was strong, and Kurama mentioned something about his father training him, but Naruto couldn't really see it. What kind of person did this Kakashi guy have to be to spoon an erotic novel? They had talked with him when he was awake earlier, and they decided the best course of action was for Naruto to protect Azuna while the man worked on the bridge, allowing Yugao to help Kakashi recover. This would let Kakashi be able to train up his team a little for the inevitable fight with Zabuza and his helper. Naruto figured the plan was okay, but he would rather not have his sensei around Team 7. He doubted they had gotten much better in the last month, and he was sure his sensei would probably dislike Sasuke and Sakura just as much as he does. Averting his eyes from the weird mask shinobi on the bed, Naruto silently left the room and walked downstairs. Sitting down at the table, Naruto watched as Tazuna's daughter, Tsunami, continued to make dinner. Tsunami was a rather pretty woman with long hair that when angled just right appeared to change between black and blue. She was rather polite, saying how grateful she was for all the Kanoha shinobi to come and help them in their time of need. 
Naruto wasn't really here to be a hero, but if that's what she wanted to believe then all the power to her. So second best, what are you doing here? Hearing the voice of Sasuke and that stupid nickname, Naruto looked up with a blank look on his face. Sasuke really wasn't very creative if he couldn't come up with anything besides second best. Hello to you two Ichiha, and me and my sensei are here to provide backup for you and your team. Your sensei and the Hokage decided it was best to have some extra people around when Zabuza came back. HN, like we need your help. I'm more than enough to take down Zabuza's help. Sure you are Sasuke. Hey, remind me how many spars you won against me at the academy, I seem to have forgotten. Seeing Sasuke walk away with another grunt, he was happy he no longer had to deal with the arrogant brat. You could always rip his eyes out. Naruto sighed, Kurama always suggested ripping Sasuke's eyes out. No Kurama, I'm not ripping his eyes out. He hasn't given me reason to yet. That didn't mean he hadn't considered it though. Laying his head on the kitchen table and watching Tsunami cook, Naruto decided to get comfortable. Between being trapped in a house with his two least favorite genin and having to protect the drunk old man in the other room all week, he figured he should at least be able to relax a bit before Zabuza attacked again. Who knows, maybe he would be lucky enough to fight someone. The end. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.